Marv Throneberry sucked at baseball, and Mets fans, well, they loved him for it. June 17, 1962, at the Polo Grounds, the Mets faced the Chicago Cubs, top of the first. Mets first baseman Marv Throneberry sabotages his team with an error for obstructing the runner during a rundown. In the bottom of the first, with the Mets already trailing 4-1, Marv seemingly made up for it when he hammered a 2-RBI triple, but was ultimately called out on an appeal play to first base initiated by Ernie Banks. An irate Casey Stengel marched out to argue the call, but before he could even open his mouth, the umpire said, Don't bother, Casey. He missed second base, too. That inaugural Mets season, Throneberry would commit 17 errors. He didn't join the team until mid-May. October of 1957, Casey Stingle's Yankees lose the World Series to the Milwaukee Braves in Game 7 at Yankee Stadium, turning the page on a season where New York City faced an unprecedented level of upheaval, and the Yankees would go from being the golden child of the city's three teams to the only child. Ten months prior, in January, pioneer and hero Jackie Robinson retired upon receiving the news that he had been traded from the Brooklyn Dodgers to their National League rival, the New York Giants. His Dodgers would finish third in the NL, stumbling a bit as fan attendance dissipated in response to owner Walter O'Malley publicly courting Los Angeles. In what began as a political stunt to leverage the construction of a new park in Brooklyn, it had become a done deal when O'Malley was granted 352 acres in Chavez Ravine. Not even the Knothole Gang could bear to watch. Sadness turned to apathy emitted from the empty stadium seating that was once renowned for its die-hard blue-collar fandom in the final home series against the Pirates. Jim Gentile's first of many career home runs would become the last ever hit at Ebbets Field, and demolition would soon follow. The following weekend at the Polo Grounds, the Giants would also host the Pirates in an unceremonious 9-1 loss in the final game that would see Dusty Rhodes, no, not that one, drive in their only run. Fans would storm the field for one last shot at closure, chasing the players, fighting over the bases, and allegedly calling for the lynching of owner Horace Stoneham. He survived to move the team to San Francisco. This mass exodus left a void in the hearts of New York baseball diehards who could not simply root for the Yankees in their stead. The expansion Mets arrived in the National League in 1962 with the Polo Grounds as their interim home while Shea Stadium was being built. Casey Stingle was at the helm, and many unclaimed former Dodgers, Giants, and Yankees players trotted onto the field. Headlined by age 38 Gil Hodges, age 39 Gene Woodling, and Philly's great Richie Ashburn. You probably know what happened next. They were historically putrid. Their 120 losses holds the full season National League record to this day. They'd be given the moniker, the lovable losers. They were so comically bad that it somehow endeared them to New York sports fans in a roundabout way and served to remind abandoned Giants and Dodgers fans that bad baseball was still much better than no baseball at all. Mets fans came to represent an outspoken youth movement and counterculture within the city. Outcasts rallying around a team of baseball outcasts despite their blunders. No player provided blunders quite like marvelous Marv Throneberry, who was traded to the Mets by the Orioles to fill in for Gil Hodges, whose knees were giving him fits. As a lot of you know, Gil would eventually manage the 1969 Miracle Mets, who defeated the overwhelming favorites, the Orioles. Marvin Eugene Throneberry, that's right, M-E-T, was born in Collierville, Tennessee, and was originally drafted by the Yankees in 1952. Marv Throneberry was a bit of a minor league phenom, seen as an eventual everyday first baseman for Stingle's dynasty in the Bronx. But fate would land them together across town 10 years later. For Stingle's birthday, the team shared a cake. Everyone got a piece except for Marv. Casey told him they were afraid to give him a piece because he'd drop it. The fans made shirts, spelled out as V-R-A-M, Marv backwards, an intentional printing error because, well, Marv was synonymous with such. This bald, clumsy southerner booting the ball around personified the season's woes. Richie Ashburn recalled a rain delay where the clubhouse roof was leaking. Marv just sat in his locker, 
letting it drip off his bald head. The two eventually made eye contact. Marv said simply, I deserve it. One day, Ashburn quizzed Throneberry on a photo of a gorgeous blonde woman in his locker, assuming he had a bit of a supermodel crush. Marv replied, That's my wife. The entire locker room was speechless. Some say that silence carried into the next day. Again, name a more lovable loser. At the conclusion of the season's futility, Marv notched a 981 fielding percentage, a record for the worst for any everyday player that stood for two decades. Throneberry hit 12 of his 16 home runs at home to the short porch in right, often in extremely clutch situations. Several were walk-offs. The fans would chant, We want Marv. We want Marv. And honestly, what did the old professor Casey Stengel have to lose? After baseball, Marv would sign on to do a massive catalog of Miller beer commercials featuring the biggest personalities of the time. He was just happy to be there. As you've seen, there are about 20 seconds worth of existing Throneberry highlights. There's nearly an hour of these self-deprecating commercials. Yet another phenomenal metaphor for his career. Marv's going to play us out. You know, it used to take 43 Marv Throne Beer baseball cards to get one Carl Perilla. So I was surprised when the light beer people called me to do this commercial. I mean, I do drink light beer, and it tastes great. It's got a third less calories than their regular beer, and it's less filling. But, you know, I'm kind of worried, because if I do for light beer what I did for baseball, I'm afraid their sales might go down. Welcome, everybody, to the light beer battle of the big guys. And there they are, two teams locked in mortal combat to decide the eternal argument over light beer from Miller. On one side, the big guys who think the best thing about light is it tastes great. Yeah, it tastes great. It tastes great. On the other side, the big guys who think the best thing about light is it has a third less calories than their regular beer. It's less filling. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, this is really no respect. Holy cow, look at that. Hi, Mickey. Hi, girls. <laughs> Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. I still don't know why they asked me to do this commercial. We have assembled here a most congenial group brought together by their love for a truly great beer. Right group? Right. It's light beer from Miller. Right group? Right. They think the best thing about it is it's less filling. It has a third less calories than a regular beer. Right group? Right. Wrong. The best thing about it, it tastes great. No, honey, it's less filling. Less filling. You still don't know. About I thought I threw you out of this floor last year. I feel very strongly both ways. I never argue. Hi, Mickey. Hi, doll. What's a nice guy like you doing in a fight like this? Waiting for you, doll. <laughs> <laughs>